this is the first talk I've given to human beings um, uh, about my book. Um, uh, it's it's not been something I've had an opportunity to do uh, 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 recently, and the book itself was written uh, throughout the pandemic, so it it is the product of uh, some some degree of isolation. And I, I should I should probably thank my uh, my partner who uh, did tolerate a number of uh, years of writing and and um, and, and perhaps unexpected uh, uh, invasion by by 18th century redcoats into our isolated household. Um, but what I want to talk to you tonight about is really split into two parts. The first part, I'm going to look at the sources that help us understand how British military development occurred throughout the 18th century. And then I'm going to do a sort of whistle stop tour of how that development occurred over the course of the period between the 1770s and through to the 1800s. It's not a comprehensive review. Um, it's it would be I'd be here for some time if I did that, um, and I'm going to focus very much on Clinton, Henry Clinton, as the sort of object which will allow us to expand that analysis um, uh, to a more general overview. Um, so this image um, is uh, from the Clements Library in Ann Arbor um, at the University of Michigan. Um, it is of a uh, drawing room in a uh, British uh, um, officer's quarters uh, in New York during the American Revolution. Um, and I've used it to try and symbolize, um, imagine, if you will, some of the sort of examples of sources that, that uh, the officers and now I and historians more general, generally can use to try and reconstruct how military knowledge was created and exchanged across time and space um, in, in the 18th century. Um, and one of the key sources for this analysis is maps. And you can see there a, a, a picture of some um, uh, uh, officers paying attention to, to a map of North America, probably reviewing uh, uh, a, um, uh, the latest campaigns by the looks of it in the south so we're talking about the the concluding ca campaign of the of the american revolutionary war um and i like to think that's henry clinton looking at himself in the mirror in horror but i don't i don't really know but let, imagine if it, if you will that he is uh, gazing at his, at his at his own image in in the mirror um and let's zoom in a little bit uh, on that so henry clinton uh in uh, 17 uh uh, became commander in chief of the British Army in North America in 1778 um, uh, after the resignation of uh, General Sir William Howe um, uh, after the debacle at Saratoga and Ge uh, General John Burgoyne's defeat there. Clinton had been until then Howe's second in command, and he had a lot of ideas of how the war should have been prosecuted. Clinton is an extremely valuable um, uh, source for understanding how military knowledge is generated in this period, principally because he didn't have a, no a, a thought that he didn't also commit to paper. Um, and in that regard is pretty rare. Most people, I think perhaps you may, may agree, don't write everything down. Um, and I, just as a sort of quick show of hands, how many people here keep a diary? The one person. Um, and so maybe your diary will end up in an archive somewhere. And maybe somebody will will use it to construct a historical narrative of, 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 of something. But the rest of you will be lost to the annals of of of, uh, uh, of time. No one will remember wh what what your particular uh, uh, thinking on a subject was. I don't keep a diary, so I'm 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 as I'm as guilty as that. I, we might also have correspondence and and, and so forth, but by and large, uh, most people don't record in any detail what it is that they think about a subject. Uh, and even those who do, I'm not going to ask you about the contents of your diary, uh, but um, even those that do generally don't write down the sort of stuff that actually I was looking for here, which is thinking about you know, how events have influenced their 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 own uh, 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 perceptions of events of of um of circumstances 
And Clinton did. He's pretty unusual from that perspective. Um, copious uh, diaries, copious correspondence, terrible handwriting, and a lot of notebooks. And these notebooks contain um, uh, a variety of things. His thoughts on reading that he, he had completed, his thoughts on uh, uh, places that he had visited, his uh, uh, memoranda of conversations he'd had with people. Um, and, and so this gives us a sort of really quite unique perspective on, on, um, uh, on how his thinking develops. And it's important to note that his thinking isn't necessarily reflective of the entire British Army's thinking, but he's not happily, he's not the only one. There are several others that I've, I was able to unearth across uh, the world. There's a, a diary of um, a British officer from the Napoleonic Wars in, the, in, in Trinity College, Dublin. There's another one of the Napoleonic Wars in the university, sorry, the State Library of New South Wales in Sydney. Um, so there are places we can go to find this stuff, but by and large, it's correspondence that, that we can rely on. And sometimes people put stuff like this into their correspondence. Um, so, but Clinton's really, really useful because of the sources that he left, left behind. Uh, in one of his uh, memoranda, he uh, noted what his plan was once he took command of the British Army and had been forced to evacuate Philadelphia. As Andrew mentioned in his very generous introduction, um, he had Clinton had lots of good ideas about how to fight the war of, uh, uh, against the Americans. But when he took command of the British Army, he was denuded of, of resources. The British government stripped him of 5,000 troops out of uh, the, uh, um, the 17 and a half thousand troops that he had available to him and sent them to the West Indies. He also he had to be prepared to send troops to Canada and to Florida. So he wasn't, and, and he was also required to defend New York um, uh, until he abandoned it to Philadelphia and also bring Washington to, uh, to battle. He realized he wasn't going to be able to achieve all of that. Um, so he came up with a very different approach to fighting the war and that was encapsulated it with this quote, he said, it shall be in my endeavor to draw Washington forward by indirect maneuvers. And his plan was from 1778 onwards to not try and strike at Washington directly, but to attack things that would force Washington to try and uh, 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 then defend those places. Um, and he thought about the Hudson River, he thought about uh, Long Island, he thought about a variety, uh, generally um, uh, ports and uh, uh, coastal facilities that that allowed the Americans to trade. Um, this was quite a different approach. This wasn't this wasn't the approach that had been adopted by Howe, and it certainly wasn't the, uh, the the approach more generally adopted by the British until until now, where uh, which had been marked really by direct uh, attack. Uh, the principal objective of the British Army. And this is a bit of a generalization, but bear with me. The principal objective of the British Army, according to most of its generals, was to close with and, and defeat uh, the king's enemies uh, in a direct and hopefully decisive battle that will result in complete victory. It was also, those of you who are familiar with the military history of, of the British across the 19th century, uh, 18th and indeed 19th century, uh, with the exception of a few glaring examples something that was nearly never achieved. Um, even the big decisive battles like Wolfe's Battle at Quebec in 1759 wasn't decisive. It didn't end the war. It took another campaign the following year to end the war against the French uh, in North America. Um, by contrast, Clinton thought that the main purpose of an army wasn't necessarily to fight a uh, direct and decisive battle, but to operate, maneuver on the on, on, on the battlefields of wherever they happen to be operating in order to draw the enemy, uh, uh, their adversary, into a, into a battle or into a uh, position of weakness, which would force them then either to fight a battle on the defensive uh, uh, and one that was where they would have, the, they were fighting at a disadvantage uh, or force them to capitulate without fighting a battle. Um, and this was a concept which he had developed alongside Henry Lloyd, who Andrew also uh, mentioned, with whom he toured a variety of battlefields in the 1770s prior 
to um, his uh, uh, um, arrival in America. And Lloyd wrote a history of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Seven Years' War in Europe. And uh, this um, book, there's actually a copy of it on the, on the shelf down the, down the end of this, this row, um, uh, it was pretty revolutionary in, in its time. It was the first uh, military history that actually uh, analyzed what was going on. It tried to create counterfactuals and discussions about why wars were being fought and what the results of those wars might have been if different decisions had, be ta had been taken. Um, so he's critically analyzing the battle, as the, the campaigns. He's not just presenting a narrative of, of the events. So this is quite a, quite a shift in the, in, 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 in the writing of military history. He also writes what uh, is later titled uh, his philosophy of war, uh, which is essentially a, a, a new theory about the art of war which very much chimes with how I've described Clinton's view of war, which is a war by indirect means, not seeking out a, a, a decisive battle unless uh, it is one where he can virtually guarantee uh, victory. So this is a completely different approach, one that the, the, the uh, most people in the British Army, most generals in the British Army don't want to, don't, don't, don't think about trying to, to, uh, to pursue because for them, glory and the achievement of a decisive victory in, in battle is really what's going to uh, bring about um, uh, both success for them and success for the nation. Um, so throughout the American Revolutionary War, and indeed throughout the majority of the, 19th, uh, the 18th century, you've got this tension between these two, two concepts about how war is fought, either direct or indirect uh, means. And this is actually a theme that runs right through the 19th and into the 20th century as well. So I think it's worth just spending a bit of time looking at how Clinton develops these ideas in the, in the 1760s and 1770s. So I'm gonna just zoom in on his, uh, uh, on his yes. <laughs> um, and let's take a, this is a, this is a bit of an anachron anachronism, largely because I don't, have such a good image of a mess from the 18th century. This is a mess from the 1830s, um, but it, it possesses all the things I need it to possess, with pictures on the wall, books on the shelves, and, the, and uh, officers sitting around a table generally reading and chatting with one another. And this is not an image that's unique to the 19th century. It is something that is generally uh, the case, as the sources suggest, from the, from the 18th century as well. And a lot of these ideas uh, are transmitted and exchanged in conversations like this, in the mess, whether it's in a building like this or indeed aboard a ship. And quite a lot of the time that the British are exchanging these ideas is when they're sailing somewhere to uh, to f to fight a, um, a a campaign. So we've got a bit of a bit of chatting going on here, but let's zoom in on what this chap is talking uh, is is uh, reading here. I'm not going to expect you to read this. I mean, I, I've literally read it myself. I can barely read the writing with a magnifying glass. And I see you've got a telescope. You might want to uh, uh, make use of that. Um, but this is uh, one of Clinton's notebooks. Um, this uh, uh, was, uh, well, I found this when I was doing my research here in 2019. Um, which uh, is not something I expected to happen, to, to be honest with you. An 18th century historian doesn't generally find new sources. Um, but this is one. Um, it was uh, marked as an anonymous notebook about mistakes of tactics in the, 16, in the 1640s to the 1750s. Um, and it is a wonderful example of a, of a notebook by um, somebody who's doing Who's, who's using notes to, to uh, remember what they're reading about. And this is a classic example actually also of how readers in the 18th century recorded the no their notes. So on the, um, uh, the right-hand page is a full list of, uh, a full page of notes, um, uh, which are taken from the uh, history of the campaigns of Marshal Turenne from the 1640s to the 1690s. Um, and the bottom sort of quarter of the page refers to the Battle of Stafarden. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but, you know, bear with me, uh, which is 14, uh, 1690. 
On the opposite page, this is left blank until uh, something happens that the original owner of the notebook wants to sort of return to their notes and reflect on what they've what they've read and written about and add in some contextual remarks about a recent event. So what's what Clinton adds on the on the left hand page is uh, a reference to the uh, to the Duke of Cumberland's campaign and battle at ha uh, Hassenbeck in uh, uh, 1757. Um, and he talks there about uh, Cumberland's defeat at Hassenbeck, compares it directly with Turenne's campaign at Staffarden, and makes comparisons about if, if Cumberland had done what Turenne had done, then Cumberland would have won the battle. So you've got a direct comparison, a use of history from, um, uh, from the 1690s, and then comparing it with uh, uh, more contemporary events. But Clinton refers to uh, campaigns much later as well. And again, you're not going to be able to see this. Um, but this is a, a, a page uh, referencing a campaign, uh, uh, a battle, Senef, S-E-N-E-F-F, -E -F, uh, from 1674 on the right-hand page. We don't really care about what's on the left-hand page because the top line of this, of this note, of, of, of the right-hand page is what's the really striking comment here. That says Washington had that merit at Monmouth. So um, he's got a note there from the 60, uh, from 1760 where the notebook was originally uh, written, and he's returned to it some point later in his career. Certainly after 1778, when the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse, of course, the courthouse was fought, and made a direct comparison with the campaign at Senef and his own experience of Washington's uh, command at the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse. Mm -hmm. So again, a reference not just to a contemporary event, but his own experience of war. Um, so here we can see Clinton's the, uh, how Clinton is using history to his, inform his own thinking about warfare as it develops over the course of the American Revolutionary era. Of course, the one thing we don't know is when he adds, uh, adds that note. I know, well, we obviously know it's after 1778, uh, and even if I didn't know it was after 1778, I could tell because the writing is so much worse. Uh, the, 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 the 16, 1760 writing is, is actually generally quite readable, uh, believe it or not. Uh, it took me a long time to translate what he had written uh, at the top, um, and it's in a much thicker pen as well. So that gives you some idea of what, what he was doing. He's using books, history books, um, to inform his idea, ideas about war. What else is going on then? Well, let's take a look at this battle, this uh, map. Um, this is uh, the Battle of Bergen, uh, fought in 1759 in Europe, in Germany. Um, and uh, this is important because uh, Clinton goes to the battlefield of Bergen in 1774 uh, with Henry Lloyd on a, what is basically a battlefield tour of Europe. Um, now, these are things that military, military officers do now to, to inform themselves about history, to learn a bit about the past and experience the sort of command difficulties that their predecessors had, had uh, experienced. I didn't generally appreciate that they did it in the 18th century, but Clinton is not the only person to go to battlefields and, and uh, actually stand on the, ba the field of battle and work out what had happened at, the, uh, at that battle and then try and dissect it and analyze it. But it, uh, we've, he's got a very detailed notebook of not, not the one that's here, incidentally, and a, a one that's held at the Clements Library in, in Michigan, um, in which he looks at the uh, uh, battlefield of Bergen with Henry Lloyd, and he basically concludes that it shouldn't have been fought. And it shouldn't have been fought because it's essentially an unnecessary battle just to try and achieve a, 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 a tactical victory. And so this informs his ideas that, you know, battles aren't, shouldn't be fought just for the sake of the battle alone. Actually, it should be fought for a particular political end. And, uh, and in, his, in, his, in his view, the battle at Bergen was just unnecessary. Um, it, it's possible that, uh, you know, as it was an allied defeat, uh, that sort of influences his thinking at the, at the same time. Um, but it's not the only battlefield that he visits, and it's not the only 
conclusion the the only type of conclusion that he draws that um that the, the so several of these battles are unnecessary um and so we can see across this this battlefield tour that takes place over several months in 1774 that uh, a lot of his thinking is being uh, influenced by this experience with uh, Henry Lloyd and about how the, uh, the, 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 the sort of penchant for fighting battle alone isn't necessarily um, uh, uh, the end in, in and of itself. Um, and by the way, I said Clint is not the only one. I've, there's, I found numerous diaries from the 1750s right, to the, right through to the uh, 1810s of officers who take the opportunity to visit battlefields when uh, historical battlefields when they can in order to learn about uh, the campaigns that took place and probably the most famous the duke of york uh, future commander in chief of the Brit uh, of the british army um, his military education is es essentially structured around visiting the battlefields of the seven years war he visits bergen he visits which he calls a very curious battlefield um, and he visits uh, 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 the battle of, battlefield of Minden, um, and he visits it with a veteran of of the of the battles, who then tells him what happens. And we know this because he writes home to tell his father about it in quite some detail, um, which is just sort of a very intriguing sort of review of, of this young man's military education and preparation for command of the British Army. So that's uh, visits to battlefields. Military knowledge is also exchanged and developed in military encampments. Now, these the British Army isn't great at these. These happen um, uh, generally right at the beginning of war or just as it looks as though a war is breaking, uh, breaking out. Um, and, uh, and this is because the British Army tends to be uh, stripped down to its bare essentials uh, in times of peace and then augmented very quickly when war war breaks out, so you need to get everyone together to train them, and so this is what's happening at on at, at this picture. There there are several examples of these sorts of events taking place outside of that timeline. Probably uh, the most famous is one that's conducted by Sir William Howe in 1774. Um, before there's any real sense in the British Army that they're about to be sent to America to fight the American Revolutionary War, um, and Howe, who had famously commanded the light infantry at the Battle of Quebec in 1759, um, actually uh, 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 creates a light infantry doctrine, which he tries to impress um, on the British army in 1774. And he actually fights a mock, ba a mock battle um, in Richmond Park in, in, um, in, uh, in a, a, an encampment like this to illustrate the value and benefit of light infantry. And briefly, it's adopted. But then, of course, the British fight the American Revolutionary War. They lose the American Revolutionary War. And that suggests that light infantry, which is only really relevant to America, after all, in, in inverted commas, is, is not relevant to warfare in Europe. And the doctrine is abandoned until it needs to be harshly relearned in the 1800s. But there are examples where military knowledge like this is exchanged in encampments like that. Uh, though uh, the evidence that Clinton ever ever attended one of these is is pretty limited. Um, there are several other examples. This is a wonderful um, set of figurines, which actually is the set that uh, is in the library here. Um, uh, one might be forgiven for thinking it's a toy. It's it's not. It is a a, a means of training uh, subalterns in the British Army, how to uh, memorize the drill, the dr uh, drill commands uh, for uh, tactical reorientation on the, on, on the battlefield. So each one of the larger cubes is a company of, of soldiers, and then the smaller um, uh, um, uh, 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 figures are sergeants. And so you have those lined up on, the, on, the, on, on, on your table, uh, you issue, issue the command, and then you reorganize according to the command you've just given, then you issue an another command, you, you reorganize. It's a way of learning the commands by rote. Um, and this is, uh, this, this is an innovation that's actually sanctioned by the Duke of York in the 1790s. And a, a George Washington has, a, has um, a set in his collection, apparently. Good, the person from Mount Vernon is nodding vigorously. 
<laughs> um, so, uh, so clearly, you've got there is there a means of knowledge transmission, which isn't a, 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 in written format or by vis visiting a physical place. Probably, though, the most common, but one that we have almost zero evidence of, is the conversation. And this, I mean, I, I, um, one of my roles in King's is teaching professional military education. I know uh, from that experience that most military education actually takes place on in an informal basis, pretty much in the bar at the end of the day. Um, uh, when people get the chance to chat and discuss what's going on. Um, the formal education is an important aspect of it, but in the absence of, of formal education in the 18th century, uh, it's things like this. Now, this is a nice picture of somebody telling a story to an implausibly wrapped crowd, which includes a dog who is listening intently. Um, uh, and in fact, this is entirely fictional scenario because I don't think a red coat would have commanded that much respect from his peers, uh, civilian peers anyway. But uh, uh, the point is made. He's he's talking about his experience of uh, of a battle of warfare, and, uh, and and in so doing, is transmitting knowledge of that experience. Now, this happens much more commonly in the mess. The the the, the larger picture of the of of the mess is illustrative of that where soldiers, officers chat to each other, they talk about their experiences. There are several diary. I mean, do you record details of conversations you've had in your diary? You do. Really, um, uh, but and what if they're quite boring? No, no. <laughs> they, I, I, it's, a, it's a kind of, I, I don't think it's a very normal person who records conversations that are quite boring. Um, but there are a couple of people who do that. One of them is this officer from not Clinton. Well, actually, Clinton does do it. Um, but there is a officer called uh, Christopher Healy Hutchinson, um, who actually does make really quite mundane observations about conversations he's had in the mess. So I don't know why, but he does. I'm glad he does, because it illustrates that actually these conversations take place. He talks about you know, we had dinner the other night. We talked about the campaign of Bergen Op Zoom, it, the one where uh, I was shot in the sh uh, shoulder. It was very interesting. OK, so you talked about that next day. We had dinner again last night in the mess, and we talked again about the, a different campaign. And this is all in preparation for a campaign they're about to go and fight. And so we know that these conversations are taking place. People generally don't put them in their diaries because, I mean, who, who does that? Um, but sometimes they do. And... So we've got evidence of it. So we can make an assumption that there's networks of exchange between officers and soldiers that transmits experience from one campaign to the next. And this is sort of what happens across the British Army in the 18th century. Um, there's lots of evidence of this in my book. I'm not going to st stand here and, and provide you with all of that now uh, because I, I suspect you might lose the will to live. But the um, the the... The, the point is that you've got these networks and this exchange of knowledge is taking place across uh, uh, across the army and it is spreading across the globe because in the 18th century, the British army is fighting in North America, it's fighting in India, it's fighting in Europe, it's fighting in North Africa, it's fighting in Australia. And the important point here is that the same people are doing the fighting. So the, the knowledge is being taken from one place to the next and exchanged as they go along. So let's return to Clinton briefly. This is an earlier picture of Clinton. This is Clinton in 1760 when he was doing the notebook that is here in, a, 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 in the library in Anderson House. Um, uh, much more dapper, I think you'll agree. Um, uh, but this is this is him before he he has all of the experiences that lead him to conclude that um, uh, 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 the war by indirect means is is the most a uh, sort of effective way of prosecuting uh, prosecuting war. Um, and the last really crucial nugget here is experience, which um, is sort of alluded to and tangentially touched on. But without that experience, you don't have the, the that information being transmitted, and in 1762, so two years after he writes this, uh, starts making notes in the notebook this year, he is deployed to Germany, 
um, as aide de camp to the uh, Prince of Brunswick, <clears throat> Prince Charles of Brunswick. And uh, in a battle at Wilhelmstal, where the Allied army becomes overextended, and as aide de camp, he's responsible for tra transmitting order orders between uh, different units of the army. He is shot in the sh uh, in the shoulder and suffers a, re a severe wound, which which actually hampers him for, for the rest of his life. Um, so, the combined effect of a battle, which is in itself unnecessary, in which the army becomes overextended and its flanks exposed, and which he suffers a, a really quite debilitating injury, that helps influence his thinking about how war should be fought. But it's not it's not the spark. It's not the cause of his thinking about that, because we know from the examples that he uses in his in his history notes that that's how he's starting to think about war uh, about warfare. <coughs> so let's take a look at how this impacts on the uh, uh, on the British Army's uh, um, experience of war in the 18th century. So we're going to zoom in on this map. Um, it's magically trans transformed into a map of the world um, uh, and uh, have a look at several campaigns um, across the uh, uh, second half of the 18th century, starting with um, a campaign in New York in 1776, one with which I'm sure many are familiar. Um, and this is... Uh, uh, William Howe is commanding at this at this battle, um, but Clinton is a very significant influence over Howe's decision making. Uh, Howe wants to launch a direct attack on the American forces. Uh, Clinton persuades him that a flanking attack around uh, the, the sort of wide outflanking maneuver um, in the bottom right hand corner of the map there is what is going to win. It's, it's going to achieve victory uh, uh, most quickly, most rapidly, and at minimal minimal losses. You know, outflank the enemy, force them to retreat, or cut off their avenue of retreat, and they'll have to surrender. Howe is much keener on the direct attack. He wants, he, and he repeatedly tries to uh, launch direct attacks throughout the campaigns that he commands in. Part of this is the influence of his own experience. In 1759, a direct attack on the French at Quebec had actually achieved massive, hugely successful results. Similarly, he'd achieved witnessed successful results at an ex extremely high cost at the Siege of Havana in 1762. Um, here, though, he's persuaded by Clinton to launch this wide outflanking manoeuvre. But Clinton has a lot of opposition amongst the uh, the British staff uh, as he presents this, this option. And it's uh, for the... Um, for the British officers who have largely got experience of fighting in America, um, uh, he's accused of savouring too much of the German school. Um, and this is one of the sort of key sort of uh, uh, debates that's taking place in the British Army at the beginning of the American Revolutionary War, where one half of the army has significant experience of warfare in America and the other half has experience of warfare in Europe. And they produce very different approaches. Clinton is looking at the outflanking maneuver, the indirect approach, how for the direct um, uh, decisive attack. Um, and and uh, Howe believes that the direct attack is going to be most successful in America because that's what's always worked in America. Uh, Clinton, using his experience from Germany, wants to try and do it a different way. And as we know from the success of the of the of the Battle of Long Island, that this is an enormously successful um, uh, 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 manoeuvre. Uh, Howe, though, declines to uh, press home the victory, and, uh, and, and Washington is able to escape to Manhattan. And then that then presages a, a campaign to, uh, to, to try and capture Manhattan, uh, which is successful. But again, Howe declines several opportunities to uh, to defeat Washington in battle, um, uh, uh, and a meeting engagement takes place at Harlem Heights um, in September 1776, whilst the rest of the American army escapes. Uh, so this uh, this illustrates the sort of tension between these two schools of thought: the American school, if you will, and the German school. And Clinton is very much a uh, a representative of the German school, 
and he's in the minority. Most of the officers who fight in the uh, American Revolutionary War have significant experience of fighting in America. Um, uh, uh, those that uh, those that don't um, uh, 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 tend, for other reasons, it's like called Wallace, to um, also have sort of an idea about war by direct means. And we'll come to Cornwallis in a second. Anyway, I'm zooming in for some pictures. Um, so here we can see uh, the uh, American army just managing to escape uh, the British. You can see the British redcoats descending in, in the background there. So I mentioned Cornwallis. And I think it's worth just dwelling a little bit on Cornwallis's approach. Um, so following um, uh, uh, the, the defeat at, Sa uh, at Saratoga in 1776 uh, and the widening of the war from a what was essentially a colonial civil conflict into a much larger global war with the entry of the French, um, uh, uh, Clinton, after he uh, takes command of the British Army, is has massive reductions to his to his fighting force uh, and is is uh, effectively forced to fight the war on a shoestring um he is persuaded to open up a southern front and he uh, begins this by captain charleston in uh, in 1780 and um then leaves cornwallis in charge at the beginning of that campaign cornwallis and clinton have a very harmonious relationship but it soon becomes clear that their approach to war fighting a bit like Clinton and Howe, uh, is very, very different. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind that there's an issue of a personality here. Clinton is a very difficult individual. Um, it's clear from his notes and his letters that he's, he's an, awkward, an awkward man. Most people, I think it's fair to say, don't like him. Um, and that tension sort of flares between him and Cornwallis. But there is also this intellectual tension about their approaches to warfare. <clears throat> Cornwallis is uh, is very is very keen again on seeking a direct uh, a decisive battle and is willing to maneuver very quickly across space in order to try to try and achieve this and so you have these huge marches against um uh, uh first um Horatio Gates and then Nathaniel Green uh in a campaign that spans uh, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, eventually concludes in uh, in Yorktown, uh, in in Virginia, and what uh, uh, the tension that exists between Clinton and and uh, and Cornwallis develops over the course of this campaign, as Clinton is very very much trying to persuade Cornwallis to launch a series of uh, uh, of operations that are going to draw the Americans into a into a battle on disadvantageous disadvantageous terms. Cornwallis, by contrast, fights a battle whenever it present, an opportunity presents, and this is what happen, uh, happens at Guildford Court, Courthouse in March 1781. It results in a British victory, but at huge, almost catastrophic losses for the British. Um, and uh, as a result. Cornwallis is persuaded to invade Virginia uh, in, a, in an attempt to try and m meet up with, with Clinton, a, a sort of far-fetched attempt to meet up with Clinton. Um, and this is what sort of results in, the, in, in what becomes the Battle of Yorktown. The tension, I think, is, is uh, exhibited in several letters between Cornwallis um, and Clinton. Um, this is actually between Cornwallis and one of Cornwallis's confidants, um, William Phillips. But it sort of it sort of gets the point across. I'm quite tired of marching about the country in quest of adventures. Um, he would rather fight this decisive this decisive battle, and when he does, of course, it's 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 decidedly uh, well. It is decisive. It's just not decisive in favour of the British. Um, and yeah, I love this picture of Yorktown. Uh, uh, it sort of illustrates the sort of whole. Uh, panoply of, of of human experience of the of 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 this war it's obviously completely fictional as uh, the french navy wasn't in in sight of of, of yorktown fighting the uh, uh, the, uh, the battle of chesapeake heights um but you've got civilians experience in the battle there experiencing the siege um uh, witnessing it and you've got the siege lines and and yorktown itself uh, rather grandly illustrated i think um in in, in the background 
Um, but this is the campaign, the battle, the siege that ends uh, essentially British intervention in North America. And you'd think that having been uh, in command of the campaign that ended that battle, that, that, that ended British control of North America, that Cornwallis would be the one to suffer the consequences. Uh, Clinton, though, is the one that, that takes the brunt of the blame. Cornwallis is better connected. Um, and he goes on to fight quite literally another battle. Um, uh, Clinton, meanwhile, his career effectively ends. Um, uh, he goes on to have several advisory uh, uh, um, roles, but he never fights another military campaign. We'll return to him maybe in a bit. Um, but Cornwallis goes in 1786 to become governor general of India. Um, in 1790 is forced to fight. Um, I say forced. It's really an engineered campaign, uh, the Third Anglo-Mysore War. Now, this is a series of campaigns that take place from 1790, uh, uh, 1791, 1792, and uh, then the also the fourth campaign, uh, 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 Anglo-Mysore War in 1799. Um, and it's taken from James Reynolds' um, uh, marches of, of the British Army in India, which is a, a uh, contemporary uh, mapping source. Um, <clears throat> But it illustrates, I think, quite effectively the scope of Cornwallis's campaigns. It has a lot of the similar uh, sorts of thinking that he uses in, in South Carolina, swift manoeuvre to try and bring about decisive battle. But he has tempered his approach somewhat. First of all, of all, of all you're seeing the transmission of ideas from North America to India and their employment there. But you're also seeing the tempering of that approach with the adoption of Indian tactics for logistics. Uh, as well as for uh, uh, approaches to marching, but also uh, a series of, of operations designed to force uh, the adversary, Tipu Sultan of Mysore, into fighting several battles on battles on disadvantageous terms. So he's adopting a sort of a bit of a, 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 a combination of the direct and the indirect approach, and is hugely successful. Uh, the campaign in 1792 results in uh, uh, almost total defeat for Mysore and is left essentially a rump state um, in South India uh, uh, and it, uh, it's only a, a sort of brief um, resurgence in 1799. Uh, so the reason that uh, the 1799 campaign is important and interesting for our purposes is that the uh, one of the key figures in that campaign is Arthur Wellesley, the future D Duke of Wellington, who on his way out to India reads all of the diaries and memoirs of officers who fought in the uh, 1790 to 92 campaigns and learns effectively how to prosecute those battles. So we can see the transmissions of ideas from the 17, 1790 campaign through to 1799. And when you think that the 1790 campaign was itself also influenced by the American Revolutionary War, which was influenced by the Seven Years' War, you can see how these ideas are being transmitted across both time and space from the 1750s in North America right through into 1799 in, uh, uh, in um, India. That's, of course, not where it stops. Oh, I keep on forgetting. I zoom in on some pictures. There's a nice picture of, well, it's not a nice picture. It's a picture of bloodshed. Um, in uh, this is the end of the of uh, the siege of Seringapatam in 1799, and uh, but from that battle, uh, Arthur Wellesley not battle campaign. Uh, Arthur Wellesley learns a very important lesson about how to fight wars in India, but it's not just about wars in India. It's how he's going to fight wars for the rest of his career. He says, in, wars, in the wars which we may expect in India in future, we must look to light and quick movements, and we ought always to be in that state to be able to strike a blow as soon as a war might become evidently necessary. So uh, Wellesley develops this idea of light and quick movements, light and quick operations, which uh, is very much a sort of development of Cornwallis's approach. And uh, we see that employed again in the, uh, throughout Wellesley's career. And I'll return to that point in a moment. Don't worry, there's only two more campaigns that I'm going to talk about. 
Um, so this one, Egypt, 1801, uh, is important because it brings together a lot of these ideas again. And it's important because it's, uh, uh, it's presaged by a 18 month effectively drift around the Mediterranean with a number of stop offs at Gibraltar, Menorca. When they go to Menorca, incidentally, they visit the battlefield, the, the, the site of the landing of Charles Stewart in 1796 and learn how that campaign was prosecuted. Uh, and they go to Malta and then they practice operations in Marmaris Bay on the 29th of, of um, uh, uh, December, which is just on the south coast of Turkey. And then they head down and they invade Egypt. Um, <clears throat> what's important about that is that for 18 months, a, a force of about 30,000 soldiers and officers are effectively floating around the Mediterranean. And with the exception of some brief interludes in, 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 with some battles at Cadiz and drop uh, spot of sightseeing in Gibraltar and Menorca, they haven't got a lot else to do except talk to each other. And this is where we, we've got the diary of Christopher Healy Hutchinson, who records all of these conversations that he has in the mess every night and talks about you know, the previous campaigns that they'd fought. And the important thing here is that this campaign is led by veterans of the Seven Years' War, Ralph Abercrombie and uh, Sir John Moore, who is a veteran of the American Revolutionary War and of campaigns in the West Indies and several other veterans of, early, of earlier campaigns in, in, in the French Revolutionary War. And all of the junior officers are officers who are going to become very important later on in the, Nap in the Napoleonic Wars. And so you've got there the transfer of that experience and knowledge taking place um, quite literally aboard ships that are floating around the Mediterranean. And there are several examples uh, illustrating that. Um, the campaign in Egypt is outstandingly, you know, outrageously successful for, uh, this is the, an image of the landing um, at Abukir Bay on the 8th of March. Egypt itself is liberated within six months and is illustrated, illustrated by a series of, of set piece battles uh, but predominantly by campaigns of manoeuvre designed to get the French to capitulate. And Cairo, in fact, falls with, without uh, a shot being, fi uh, being fired. Um, when the battles are fought, uh, the, tactic, uh, the tactics and the, uh, the, the operations that are employed are distinct mixtures of American approaches and European approaches. And you finally got the merging of American and, and European thinking about war. Um, and you've got essentially the, 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 the rump of what becomes the British army that goes on to success much later, about uh, 15, 10 years later in the Peninsula War under the command of the, by then, uh, General Lord Wellington, Arthur Wellesley. And uh, in uh, an example of the transfer of ideas from India, and the sort of confluence of tactics from America and uh, and and Europe, you see Wellington in uh, uh, 1813 employ what is essentially light and quick movements on a grand scale. So this sort of subset of the map in the bottom right hand corner is actually a 450 mile long march that takes place over the course of three weeks, and it is successful because Wellesley Wellington moves his baggage. Uh, his supply depot from Lisbon and the Portuguese coast to Santander uh, uh, and San Sebastian on the north coast of Spain. Uh, so as he's marching to northeast Spain, his supply lines are being moved in order to meet him. And it happens almost um, uh, down to the day. There's only a couple of days where the, where the British troops are without supplies. And that really is a combination of American, Indian, and European tactics and operational practices being employed um, uh, 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 on campaign. And this results in the, the, uh, the Battle of Victoria on the 21st of June, 1813, which is a decisive, one that most people haven't heard of, but a decisive victory over the French um, uh, in Spain and effectively Sp uh, French control of Spain ends after this battle. Of course, most sort of lessons that have taken place in the, in the, in the uh, Napoleonic Wars are wiped out by the experience of Waterloo. 
which is essentially a traditional battle, a massive uh, slogging match of artillery fire against artillery fire, and musketry against musketry. But um, uh, and results quite uniquely in in uh, in this period in a literally decisive victory. And of course, what this just sort of ratifies the 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 uh, the, uh, 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 the prevailing view amongst many officers that actually armies are capable of achieving decisive victory so the sort of coda to all of this is that the lessons that uh, of the, uh, of this transmission of knowledge over the course of 50 60 years of british military experience get abandoned over the next 50 years as uh, repeated attempts to achieve decisive victory and you see this in crimea for example in the 1850s result in 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 huge casualties and slaughter um and so that concludes my uh brief how brief oh bang on um uh analysis of the of uh the sort of knowledge transmission of knowledge and knowledge exchange that takes place in the 18th century for more on this of course you could have a look at what this officer is reading um and if you've if if, if you're so minded you have mobile phones with cameras on it turn them on scan this code it'll take you straight to amazon.com where you can order it now thank you very much So I think if uh, I'm happy to take any questions. If, yeah. I just want to get it. Yeah, it was lower. It's not used to. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a microphone heading down for you. <laughs> You're going to do us a little number. It's a question down here, Andrew. I, I wanted to ask if you could tell us more about how you um, took the um, unidentified diary and concluded it was Clinton's. Was it because you knew his handwriting? Yes. Uh, uh, so uh, in case that wasn't, I don't know if that the microphone was on then, was it? It was? Oh, cool. Oh, it's just for the, okay. So uh, if you couldn't hear that at the back, it's how I identified the, um, the diary. Um, so... Yes, it's the writing. As soon as I opened it, I didn't say this at the time because I was too shy. I thought there's no way this can be a Clinton. It's a Clinton. It's got to be a Clinton. The the handwriting and the tone as well. Right. So it's not just about, you know, how it's written, but the, the style in which it's written. It was pretty it was pretty obvious immediately. It was it was Clinton. Um, and there were signature examples of of certain letters and um a uh, 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 word construction that um that was a bit of a giveaway um i th there's a, the d is very distinctive which is a sort of a curved over the the tail is curved over which i thought well, that's clinton but apparently everyone did that in the 18th century so that wasn't actually the giveaway i thought it was several other uh ones were uh, actually for ha we had a handwriting expert take a look at it <laughs> And she pointed out, actually, it's not so much individual letters that are the important point. It's uh, how words are constructed, how the letters are joined together. Um, uh, and when, they, when they're when they put together in a certain style, that's a real giveaway. And I, we sent um, some notebooks that we knew were Clinton and um, examples from this one. And she said, yeah, there's no doubt it's the same. It's the same author. So, yeah, it was, I was pretty chuffed with that. I don't think... I think the only person more excited was Alan Clark, who um, is, was the library director here until recently. And um, uh, yeah, she was, I think she might have done a little dance. Not, you know, maybe maybe she just looked very happy. I don't know. But... Could you talk a little about the evolution of technology, of firepower, of tactics based on new weaponry and new uh, modes of transport and the, I guess the industrial revolution that was taking place first in England and how mm. that impacted war making. Mm. Yes, yeah, sure. So um, this actually is more impactful in the 19th century and um, maybe in five or 10 years, the sequel to this, which I'm, I've just started doing some research on, uh, we'll, we'll look at that because I mean, in terms of technological improvement in transportation, 
that really is you're talking about steamships um, that doesn't really factor until later in the 19th century. Um, uh, the uh, communications technology obviously improves in the night. So you've got a bit of communications improvement with semaphore signaling, um, but it doesn't dramatically improve improve communications. And it's only very simple and terribly prone to error. Um, an example being where, you know, fog will basically cause problems, right? So, uh, and you could, on a clear day, you could transmit an, a, um, uh, a message from Plymouth to London um, which is you know opposite ends of the of the country in eight minutes, which is pretty good going. I find that mind boggling, unless some fog descended, in which case that blocked the whole thing, or you missed a critical bit of the signal. So, the message after Wellington defeats the French at Salamanca in 1812 is transmitted. The, the message is Wellington defeat French at Salamanca, and all that got through was Wellington defeat Salamanca. Uh, which caused a little bit of discombobulation in 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 London because the opposite, so prone to error. Um, <clears throat> weapons technology is 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 more important. You've got the development of rifle technology in the in the eighteenth century. There's a substantial discussion about this in in the book, um, and several attempts during the American Revolutionary War itself to employ rifles, <clears throat> many of which aren't particularly successful. Um, the fame, possibly the most famous rifle is Ferguson's rifle, um, uh, which is notoriously prone to, to, to jamming. And so that causes quite a bit of, uh, 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 you know, it, 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 there's a lot of skepticism then of the rifle as a result. Uh, and you've also got examples of Daniel Morgan's riflemen being taken in flank and they can't reload fast enough. So they, 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 there's uh, in the retreat, I think, it's either in the campaign, the Brandywine campaign, or in, you might know this more than me, the, or in the retreat from uh, Philadelphia in 1778, um, uh, uh, Morgan's, uh, some of Morgan's riflemen are actually defeated by, uh, by uh, musketeers, and uh, a lot of British officers conclude that the rifle is just not a useful weapon because it takes so long to reload. Um, <clears throat> By the uh, 1790s and uh, certainly into the 18, uh, the first decade of the, of the 19th century, you've got the employment of the Baker rifle, which is more reliable, still takes a long time to load, um, uh, and uh, you can only fire a couple of shots a minute, whereas the musket in a well-trained uh, soldier's hands, you could fire for possibly five, but realistic, realistically three or four rounds a, a minute. Um, it's uh, but it's terrifically inaccurate. Um, so this weapon will, um, you'll you'll really only hit your target if the target's within 30 yards. Um, so the, hence the, the expression, see the whites of their eyes. Um, uh, any more than that, and you're, more, you're quite likely to miss, um, uh, which is why disciplines are important. You've got to, you know, the soldiers can't fire until the, 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 the adversaries are close enough to actually um, uh, have an impact and why mass is important because you want a weight of lead in order to, to guarantee uh, hitting somebody. Um, the rifle means that you can hit people further away, but you can hit fewer people because it takes longer to reload. So you then get the, uh, the development of sharpshooters, which is uh, itself an evolution of the light infantry tactics and the established in North America in the 1750s and actually in a, an evolution of tactics from the 1600s. You know, you've, you've got uh, ranger tactics being employed um, uh, uh, much earlier than the French and Indian War. Um, so in terms of the technology enables some of the tactics that already exist. And those tactics are really um, employed as a result of the environment in which the wars are being fought. So the reason why I said the conclusion was that light infantry tax are only useful in America is because American terrain is dominated principally by woodland, by close, closed backcountry terrain, which is not really present in Europe. Um, you've got a lot of open country, um, large fields of battle and so forth. So fewer places to, to, to hide amongst trees. Um, uh, but uh, the French ably demonstrate in the 1790s that actually light infantry tactics, the so-called chasseurs or the tirailleurs, 
are more than capable of, of, of inflicting quite significant casualties on on mass on the mass ranks of British infantry. But this isn't really a technological innovation. It's an organizational innovation pre precipitated by environment rather than technology. Technology just enables it more. And the Baker rifle is a really important aspect of that. Um, and we see that really coming to prominence and uh, 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 truly effectively in the Peninsula War with the 95th Rifles um, uh, really being used expertly by Wellington. Um, so yeah, that's a synopsis of it. There's a lot more, I suppose I could say, um, but the, the principal impact of the Industrial Revolution is yet to happen to warfare. It's going to impact uh, the campaigns in from Crimea. I mean, Crimea is a, a, it's such an interesting war because by then you do have, you've got the mini rifle, right, which has got a, a, an effective range of about 400 yards, but British tactics haven't changed at all. In fact, um, one veteran of the, well, several veterans of the, of the Napoleonic Wars um, are advised against adopting the rifle. They, they argue why do we want to adopt a we weapon that's going to have to make us change all our tactics? We're really good at those tactics where we can use the musket, which we're really good at using. Why do we want to change that and, and have to employ a rifle instead? Let's stick with the musket. You know, got to be able to see the whites of their eyes. Quite literally, they say that, you know, it's, uh, war isn't war unless you can see the whites of their eyes sort of, sort of comment. Um, <clears throat> I'm thinking of Charles Napier and William Napier, incidentally. Um, and uh at Crimea then they they've all got mini rifles but they had the tactics haven't adapted to take account of this you know enormously effective weapon in their hands so they're still being told not to fire until they can see the whites of the Russian size um and the soldiers work out that actually it has a really good range and so in uh, one thing which I didn't really talk about here is that there's a lot of bottom-up innovation and, and adaptation which is ideas being fed up from the ranks by soldiers who are basically <laughs> not wanting to die. So they, they come up with, uh, with uh, new ideas to avoid dying. Um, for, for our period, it's things like cutting the tails off their coats so they don't get stuck in bushes, sh wearing, wearing berets rather than tall hats so they don't get stuck in bushes. Um, and you know, reducing basically the flim flam of their of their uniform so they don't get stuck in bushes. Um, they also brown their muskets so they're, they're they're less visible, and the rangers tend to adopt brown uniforms rather than red, so they they can get stuck in bushes and not get shot at. Um, so uh, those are the sort of ground up innovations that you see in uh, in our period in in the seventeen fifties and seventeen seventies. Um, but in the Crimea, the ground-up innovation is let's shoot people when they're 400 yards away because then they can't shoot us. And you see this at the Battle of, of the Alma. And the officers are horrified. You can't see the whites of their eyes. Um, the soldiers are, are, are doing it. Any, any other questions? As you can tell, I can talk about this at some length for some time. Oh, yeah, for that. <laughs> Is there anything unique to the uh, American uh, theater that uh, that the generals, the the officers used in other parts of the world? Well, I think that would be that would be light infantry, um, which uh, so uh, for the for the British at least, light infantry tactical development takes place in America, and it takes place because of the environmental conditions that the British face when they're in uh, when they're in America. I mean, the Battle of the Monong Monongahela. Um, uh, in the Ohio Valley, 1755. Um, this is a you know v nearly catastrophic defeat for the British, um, where a an army of um, well, it's two thousand that are sent, but it's only about seven hundred that are fighting this battle, are all but wiped out by a uh, a much smaller group of of French and Native American warriors who are who. Uh, you know, camouflage themselves and 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 use use the trees and and and, and local terrain to to uh, uh, hide themselves. Whilst the British all 
and this is there's a lot of research that sort of pokes holes in this theory but let's go with it anyway for the for the moment but the british sort of line up in mass ranks in order to try and fight this fight off this this uh, hidden enemy um and uh, and out of that i mean it's, you know it's cat this this shocking defeat of two battalions of uh, uh, uh british regular soldiers mm -hmm. sent explicitly to america to to stop the french threat from developing it has a huge impact on british thinking and there's a sort of re realization actually we need to do something about this and so you see the evolution of light infantry um, um tactics over the next sort of 10 well less than that uh, uh five years or so which really comes to fruition by 1759 um uh and the 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 quebec campaign you know wolf's sorry um how's uh, uh by leading light infantry up the cliffs towards the plains of abraham um uh uh, uh he manages therefore to outflank uh, uh the french army as it's forming up on the plains um sort of hugely important demonstration of how light infantry isn't just a thing that you use in the woods you can actually use it to to have a, an enormous impact on the way in which war, uh, you know, conventional battles are fought. Um, <clears throat> defeat of the American Revolution convinces a lot of British officers that actually light infantry is is not relevant anymore because we're not going to be fighting in North America in the woods anymore. So actually, why let's abandon this and we'll we'll stick with the with the the massed ranks, the Prussian uh, approach to war fighting. Um, and over the course of the 1790s, um, it becomes clear, actually, that light infantry is vitally important. And so you see a lot of the ideas that have uh, that have been abandoned in um, formally abandoned uh, still exist in people's in people's minds and, and experiences. So Ralph Abercrombie, John Moore, uh, um, Air Coote, all of them have experience of the use of light infantry from North America. And they're able then to just roll out those ideas in in Europe in the 1790s. Um, so it develops very much organically as a, as a result of that. So I, I mean, there are several others, but that's probably the the most crucial um, uh, um, example, I think. And the light infantry today, it, certainly the British Army, sees itself as having evolved from from the American campaigns. So we've got a question just behind you, and then we'll come to you. So with a follow up to that, I, I guess when I went to school, we learned that the tactics that they used in uh, the revolution the, on, on the, uh, the side of the um, revolutionaries was a kind of guerrilla warfare. And so are you saying that this light infantry is adapting to that rather than? Uh, yeah, I mean, the idea of like. <clears throat> your first slide drawing them out yeah uh, so it's a little bit so there's there's a bit of emerging of ideas there i suppose but clinton is actually not a fan of light infantry he sees he's a, uh, a someone who's been brought up in the german school after all so he he actually sees you know the sort of bigger tactical and operational maneuvers as the as the critical thing there and he sees light infantry there's a quote which I, I remember reading and then I couldn't find it. It's one of those annoying things where you read it and you didn't make a note of it, but it's a wonderful. So I'm just going to sort of paraphrase it. But he talks, you know, he doesn't like the beret that they wear. It's, you know, the slouch hat, you know, your slouch hat, slouched appearance. Um, and I, he talks about them chasing sheep or something like that. So it's a really disparaging comment about the light, about light infantry. He doesn't, doesn't regard them very highly at all. Um, but uh so yeah but, but others um do consider it a very important innov innovation and it is a combination of of the so-called guerrilla approach um which um it, you see employed in numerous theaters not just in in north america um and a a, a tactical response to the environment um so it's a combination of those of those things um, you don't tend, though, to see light infantry deployed very successfully against guerrillas because guerrillas are targeting different light infantry is used in order to achieve a advantage in skirmishing or in, ta in, in, a, in, a, in a tactical engagement in a, in a battle. Um, 
guerrillas are used to, to attack supply lines to to um uh you know discombobulate the enemy in different ways um so it's this, it, whilst the, the the sort of um the thinking behind it might be similar the actual employment is very is very different finally my my real question was going to ask you about the role of intelligence and how it evolved okay uh well <clears throat> how long have you got um so you uh, you see uh lots of uh, of intelligence usage throughout the um throughout the 18th century the, so the principal difficulty for use of intelligence is is speed um how how quickly you can get the message that you need to get to to uh, whoever needs it and for it to be secret enough that it's not going to be inter intercepted by by uh, your enemy um so uh you see uh you know, a lot of use of human intelligence of spies um to 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 bring in information from uh, uh from enemy encampments um uh, obviously a very dangerous pursuit and in some cases extremely unreliable because generally they only do that for payment and if you pay somebody to bring in intelligence then they're more likely to just make it up um so it's it's not a terribly reliable um uh pursuit you see more effective use of intelligence later in the in the in the wars in in the Napoleonic Wars. I suppose the British have difficulty with intelligence gathering in in North America because they're they're ideologically on the back foot. So there are examples where they've got good intelligence, but it's much less extensive than the Americans have. Um, <clears throat> you know, of course, John Andre, the famous. Um, uh, example in the, um, the turncoat Benedict Arnold, but um, uh, but in terms of the actual building of a spy network, it's it's pretty it's pretty limited. You do have little sort of nuggets of examples. There's a really there's a wonderful uh, anecdote I got from the New York Historical Society actually in the papers of Horatio Gates, um, where. Um, so this is the Saratoga campaign. Clinton had been trying to orchestrate a diversionary operation to try and relieve Burgoyne. Uh, he gets so far up the Hudson, but then realizes he hasn't got enough forces to break through. And so he sends through a courier with a note in a tiny little note wrapped up inside a, a musket ball. Um, and this courier gets captured by the, the Americans. And the note just says, I cannot proceed any further. You, you're on your own, basically. Um, the courier gets captured and he's interrogated, but he doesn't give up his information. But the the, the interrogators are thinking, well, this, this musket ball is quite a bit lighter than the other musket balls. And there's something a bit dodgy about this. And whereupon he snatches the musket ball and eats it. And uh, so they they give the individual, the unfortunate individual, a, a, an emetic, which doesn't, and the the line of things, this doesn't produce the desired effect. So we are waited for the opposite. Such an elegant way of saying what's about to happen, right? So that eventually happens, and they get it, and they open it up, and they've got this. They find this note. Uh, so Gates knows that Clinton isn't coming and Burgoyne doesn't know. So you've got sort of a couple of examples there where, you know, it doesn't happen very often where the uh, one the, the one party is better informed than the other party about what's going on. Um, uh, but yeah, so it's little examples like that, but um, intelligence becomes much uh, a much more effective for the British in the, in, in the Napoleonic Wars where, um, particularly in Spain, where they are fighting a campaign which is on, on, for them on friendly to, on friendly soil. Um, so they're fighting in Spain to liberate Spain. So they got a lot of local support. And so they've got a huge intelligence now, uh, human intelligence network in Spain, which brings in you know, enormous quantities of intelligence. Wellington is extremely well informed about what's, got, what's going on. And in a, an, another example of just what I mentioned where he's better informed than his adversary and this is actually a problem because he doesn't know he's better informed than his than his than his adversary so he actually acts as if uh his adversary knows what he's he knows and then 
his adversary doesn't act like that and so he's like why why isn't he doing this and it's because marmont his adversary doesn't know what wellington knows so it's it's a you know example where you know the it, it's not intelligence is only useful if it is what the enemy knows um as well as what as, as what you you know um so it, it it's it, there's sort of almost too good a network because all of the all of the dispatches are being intercepted anyway you can read about that in my other books buying for wellington so did you have a question um it got answered but ah. Okay. All right. Well, our in-person audience must be synced up with our virtual audience because if we're getting all the same questions, so it's just killing two birds at, at, with one stone at once here. Um, so um, I think we're just going to wrap it up there. I think okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Davis, I want to thank you very much for making the trip across the pond to be here for us. And, uh, and thank you, everybody in person and to our virtual audience at home. You'll be able to see this up on our YouTube and uh, YouTube channel and website very shortly. Um, and thank you for your continued support of our mission. So get home safe, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.